You like chocolate pie? You like it for lunch? And then again for supper? And maybe another slice before you go to bed at night. And you know what your wife's going to fix for breakfast the next morning? More chocolate pie. 10 o'clock snack, chocolate pie. Lunch, chocolate pie. Afternoon snack, chocolate pie. After about six weeks of chocolate pie, do you still want a chocolate pie? Do you still want a chocolate pie? No. Oh, you're about ready for a strawberry pie, right? But you don't want strawberry pie like you had the chocolate pie over and over. We like a variety. Go to Walmart and you can buy those cheesecakes. It's got like eight different flavors all around it. So you can have a variety of different types of cheesecakes. We know sermons are the, the same way. When I taught for Union, uh, I, one of the classes I taught was principles of preaching. And in that I would teach there's five different styles or types of sermons. There's an expository sermon where we take a passage of scripture and you walk through the verse uh, word by word or sentence by sentence teaching an expository type sermon. Uh, there was topical or subject type messages where you might preach on the second coming of Christ or preach on the blood of Christ or preach on tithing or on some area. Uh, and then there's really what's probably one of the most popular forms of preaching. People seem to enjoy it better. It's called narrative preaching, which is telling a story. Uh, biblical narratives are normal where you tell the story of the prodigal son or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and then you take that, that message, that story that, uh, from the scriptures, and you preach from it. But there's another type of narratives called secular narratives, where you take a secular story, and you find that there's applications in the secular story, such as in the story of the... Well, thank you very much. I'm glad some of y'all are paying attention already. Uh, and so I thought I'd just preach on the three little pigs. They're, they're found in Second Pork, uh, chapter 3, verse 14, if you want to turn there in your Bible today. That's like Second Hezekiah. Uh, and to quote our great co-pastor, I'm preaching from the tutor to the rooter today. Uh, so I said that right, right? I said it right? Okay, right. Uh, just, just want to make sure everyone did. Uh, yeah, do, I had to give him credit, otherwise that's considered plagiarism if I use his quote not correctly. But the three little pigs, you remember the story of the three little pigs, right? How the three little pigs, they decided mama threw them out or mama told them it's time to leave home. And they went to build their house and one built the other house out of straw. Another one built their house out of stick and another one out of brick. Uh, the guy with the straw built it because that was the cheapest and the quickest way to get his house built because that little pig wanted to go play. He was not really interested in what kind of house he had, just how he could quickly get through, not spend much money, and have his money to do what he wants to do and act like he wants to act. Then there's the little pig that built his house out of sticks. Now that took a little bit longer and a little bit more money uh, to build a house out of wood there. And then there's the third little pig. Boy, he spent a lot of money, and it took him a whole lot longer to build his house out of bricks uh, than it did the other two little pigs. And while the other two are out playing... Uh, the one that built his house out of brick is still building his house and getting it right. I'm sure they came by and laughed at him uh, because he was taking so much time in what he was doing. Uh, the house that was built out of straw and the house that was built out of sticks, but the house that was built out of bricks. So with that in mind, I want us today to think about how does this apply to the Christian life? And it really does. I find many people are trying to build a religion or a Christian life out of straw, out of things that will not last, out of things that, you know, really, how many of you here would even think about building a house out of straw? If you've had anything to do with hay or straw before, you know it's not going to last. Uh, the wind comes along anyway and blows half the straw away, or it rains, it leaks. Uh, sticks is, is some better. But we all would say, well, yeah, let's build a good house. Let's build a solid house, a house built out of blocks. Well, then there's the, the big bad wolf. He's, he's a main part of this story. He comes along, uh, and he's there to uh, eat the pigs. Now, you've got to remember, I'm old. I went to school back when the real story was he came to the house, built a straw, and he huffed. 
and he puffed and he blew the house down and he ate the pig. Now I know our children nowadays are not taught that because it's too gruesome to describe or to talk about that the little pig got ate. Uh, the new version says he ran to the brother's house built out of sticks. So, uh, but it goes better if you have the old version of the story where he eats the little pig and then he goes to the house of stick and he blows the house down that's made out of sticks and he eats that pig and then he's, you would think he was full by now after eating two whole pigs. But he goes to the third house. Maybe there's a week between these visits. He goes to the third house made out of brick and as he goes into that house or goes up to it, he huffs and he puffs and he can't blow the brick house down. It's not built out of straw or sticks. It's a strong, firm house. And so with this house, he says, I can't blow it down. So he climbs up on top of the roof and he goes down the chimney. And if you remember in the story, the little pig had a pot of oil boiling. And when he came down the chimney, he fell in the oil and it killed him. Uh, of course, if you're doing the modern, modern version of this, he came down the chimney and they were cooking and the three little pigs that he didn't eat were all sitting around the table and they invited the wolf to eat with them and they came to some type of compromise. Yeah, liberals. That's <laughs> I want us to talk about three different people groups. I want us to see that there's some similarities to these three houses and to the way that some people are trying to build the house that they want to live their life in. We are all trying to live this life that God has given us. Some people want to live it without God. Some people want to live it with God but doing it their ways. And some people do want to commit their life to Jesus Christ. To establish our story, let's start off. Who does the big bad wolf represent? That shouldn't be too hard to figure out. He represents the devil. His desire is to huff and puff and blow your life away. To destroy you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober. Now, this is not a verse on drunkenness. There's plenty of other verses that said you shouldn't drink alcohol uh, and that you shouldn't get drunk uh, throughout the Bible. But in this case... When Peter speaks here, when he says, be sober, he's talking about a mindset. Don't, don't have your mind so full of, of this thought and that thought and other thoughts. And, and in other words, the things of the world and trying to be religious and trying to have thoughts of God. And you got so many thoughts going on, you can't keep your brain clear, or your mind clear. He says, be sober, be one-minded, be vigilant. That word means don't give up, don't quit, keep on the thought. You know, sometimes we're at church today, so we're thinking very spiritual thoughts. But by tomorrow, we might be thinking more worldly when we get to work. Our, our language at church might be different from our language at work tomorrow, which it should not be. That's what Peter is saying here. He says, be vigilant in the life that you're living. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, your enemy, the devil, is as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may eat. Who he may devour. Who he may destroy. Just like the three little pigs had an enemy that came to destroy their houses, destroy their life, and to end their life, that would please the devil to punch. He would be so glad to come and to destroy your family, destroy your home, destroy your life, destroy your relationship with Jesus Christ. Satan wants to huff and puff and blow you away from God. That's his, been his plan. It still is his plan. Well, who are the three different people groups? What do the three pigs themselves represent? Well, there's the houses that are built out of each different straw, wood, and brick. But God says how to build a house. I am sure that if those pigs had called the building inspector to come down there, he probably would have told them, you know, a house out of straw is not a great idea. He probably would have told the one out of sticks. He says, sticks will work, but they're not the best product to build from and he probably approved the plans and said this is good on this brick house that you're looking at building well God is the building inspector and God wants to tell us how to build a house and what is the right way to build a house the question is is do we want to listen do we want to know what God thinks about building the house that will stand Psalms 127 verse 1 except the Lord build the house Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. 
You know, we, we have people, and we might be some of them, who've got all these plans about how life should be. Some people have the conception that if I go to church on Sunday morning, I'm good. That's all I've got to do. If I go on Sunday morning, then the rest of the week is mine. I can go where I want to, do what I want to, because on Sunday morning, I'm going to be at church, and, and that keeps me in a right relationship with God. And that's not what God actually teaches. God teaches a life that is committed to Him Sunday through Saturday. No, no day do we say, this is my day off from being a Christian. This is my day off from serving the Lord. The Lord says that He builds the house. And they that build it any other way are building in vain. Matthew chapter 7, that's verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doth them, I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon a rock. Now, the wording, we just read rock, and you might be thinking about, well, I can hold a rock in my hand. You might be thinking about what we might call a boulder when it comes to sizes of rock. Uh, in the Greek language, when Jesus is talking to Peter on different kinds, he refers to Peter as the small rock, the Petros, the little bitty rock. Uh, it could actually be sand or pebbles, something that is, that is very tiny. Uh, you really wouldn't want to build a house on anything like that. But when Jesus makes the reference to building it upon the rock, which is upon Jesus Christ, in the comparison to the two different soils in chapter 7, the solid rock and the shifting sand, he says, build it upon the rock. And the word rock here uh, is, is not the small rocks. It's not like a gravel floor. Uh, it's not even a, a large rock. Well, this is a boulder size. No, the wording here means a solid foundation, a large foundation. Not just that it's a 20 by 20 or a 20 by 40, but also, this rock might be six feet deep. It is something solid. I don't know if you've been to many different types of shore, uh, but if you go to Gulf Shores, you find sand everywhere. You walk 60, 70, 80 feet, 100 feet from uh, where you're staying down to the water, and you walk out into the water, it's all sand. The water comes in, it brings sands in, the water goes out, it takes part of the sand out with us. It's constantly moving and constantly shifting. If you were to go to some other areas of our country, you find that it's not sand. You find areas that are mud. And that mud washes up and the mud goes back out with the water. Uh, you sure wouldn't want to build there because it's very slippery. But there are some shores, some in California, some in Hawaii, some in the northeast, that are solid rock. The ones in Hawaii are lava rock. And they are just as thick and just as solid all the way down uh, as they are on top. And it is a solid foundation. It, it might have some loss as the water comes in and works on it. But that rock is still going to be there 100 years from now that is there today. Because it's a solid, huge mass of rock. And when Matthew is speaking here, when Christ is speaking here, he's trying to get a point across. Find you something solid. To build your life. Don't build it on sand. Don't build it on mud. Build it on a solid foundation. Verse 25. And the rain descended and the floods came. And the winds blew and beat, and beat upon the house. And it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. I just wonder if the disciples were already remembering back. With the thought about Peter and the little rocks and the big rocks. And realizing that he's not talking about a rock out somewhere else, he was talking about build it upon Jesus Christ. Build it upon the things of God. Build it upon what God has said is a solid foundation for life. Many people nowadays are, are building upon all sorts of foundation. They, they believe a certain lifestyle is okay. They believe you can live this way one day and live this other way another day. And because of our mixture, there's no solid foundation. And believe me, the homes are suffering Families are suffering, lives are suffering because there's no solid foundation. When I was a, a sophomore in high school, yes, I rode a dinosaur to high school. It's been that long ago. Uh, we were building a house. My mom and daddy was building a house down in Mississippi. Uh, and they got plans and they took the plans. And back then, you didn't have just one guy that kind of built your house. You hired a guy to pour the foundation. You hired another guy to do the framing. 
You hired another guy to do the AC. You hired another guy to hang the sheetrock. You, you had all these different people that you would hire in, and one would do his job, and he'd leave, and the next guy would show up. Well, my daddy hired the concrete man. Plumber came in, put down the plumber, and the concrete man came in, and he poured the foundation. He got through, and it's time for the framing guy to come in. And here comes the framing guy in, and he starts putting frame up. We go down one night to see how the house is coming after work, and we walk out there, and in the front left-hand corner of the house, the frame is sticking out about six foot further and about eight foot across. There's no foundation. It's just open down to the ground. Uh, now back over here, there's the foundation, but six foot by eight foot is just a hole, but the walls are out over there. You know, I'm sure my daddy thought that didn't really matter. I'm sure my daddy, for a few moments, said, well, when the carpet man gets here, he can just stretch the carpet over and staple it around that wall. No, my daddy didn't. But would that work? Would that keep the critters out who might decide to try to get into the house one night? Would that... What about when... Me and my brother was running around the house and we ran off the solid foundation out onto that carpet that was stapled up. Uh, the two of us out there, it, it would probably pull the staples out of the wall and we would fall and get hurt because the foundation was not under the whole house. I think that is a, a picture, an illustration of what is going on and what is happening in among Christian lives. I think lost people are not building upon the solid foundation of Jesus Christ because they do not have Christ to build upon. But I think a lot of Christians are building a foundation, but they've got an extra room over here that is not on the foundation. This life that they live, these choices that they're making outside of Christ. And when we find ourselves falling through the floor of that part of our lives, when we find that our children fall into that hole, and we say, how did this happen? It's because we didn't put them on a solid foundation. The foundation, the solid rock of Jesus Christ. The house built upon the rock, the foundation of Jesus Christ, is based upon the Word of God. If you're going to have a brick house with a solid foundation, then once you have the foundation of Jesus Christ, one wall needs to be the Word of God. Another wall needs to be the wall of prayer. Another wall needs to be Christian fellowship and church fellowship. Another wall might be that of witnessing. No, there's got to be some ceiling across here somewhere, and that's going to be the ceiling of lordship. That we live a Christian life with these basics and these principles. Are we willing, are we committed enough? The Christian life is not a game. And many people are playing at being a Christian. You might be saved, but it doesn't mean you're living the Christian life. The Christian life is a choice. It's a choice you make every day, every afternoon, every moment to say, I belong to Christ. This is not Christ's way. This is what, I, not what the scriptures and the Lord would tell me to do. I can't do this way. I can't live. This is wrong. The Christian life is hard work. It, it doesn't get easier. Some people get saved and they think, well, now that I'm saved, God's going to take care of me and I'm not going to have any more problems. When you get saved, the devil attacks. you got more problems. God will make you stronger through the midst of it. But a, a strong foundation gives you the ability to build walls and to build a house that is not going to shift every time the wind blows. It's not going to be blown away by every time the, the wolf howls outside. The commitment to the Christian life is a commitment to Jesus Christ, to the Lordship of Christ, where He lives and works in our life each and every day. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said to them, Jesus said unto them, does that include everybody? Yes. It does. Does that include me and you? Yes. yes. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. This is not a choice you made in January the 28th, 1962. And I was saved back then, and I don't have to worry about the rest of it. It's not a choice you made whatever day you gave your heart to Christ. It is, I have to get up this morning and Monday morning 
and whichever morning and realize that I'm committed to Christ, I'm committed to living for Him, if my house is to remain on the solid foundation, if it's to be a brick house when the devil blows, he cannot blow it down. Take up the cross daily and follow Jesus Christ. Do you live in a brick house? Do you live on a solid foundation, a firm foundation? Matthew 7, verse 25. For it was founded upon a rock. Is your life today, are you in the brick house? Are you on that solid foundation? Or is your life the house of sticks? Now I'm going to say my concept is the house of sticks is the person who is a born again Christian. He's been saved. He has the solid foundation, but he just used the wrong building materials. He went with sticks. And when the big bad wolf came along, he blew the whole house away because it was just sticks. And for many Christians, for most Christians in today's world, every time the devil attacks, he seems to win. People say, I just can't beat the devil. Because our house has a solid foundation, but what we have built upon it is a house of sticks. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of God. Of men. Your faith is what? Not standing in the wisdom of man. By what I think. Do I think it's right or wrong? Do I think it's okay? Does everybody else say it's okay? You know, this might cover an area that we refer to many times uh, as politically correct. Or we live in the South, we don't do that down here. We say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. Up north, they don't say that anymore. So, you know, does culture change what we believe, how we act, what we practice? Do, uh, does our faith stand on what somebody thinks? Or does it stand on the power of God, what God has said? The house of sticks is built by what I think, what I feel. Our faith is so weak that it will not stand up to demonic or satanic attack. Most Christians are just blown away when he comes. All we can do is lay down on the foundation of Christ and cover our head and cry out, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, because everything we have built is being destroyed and blown away because it's on the thoughts and the ways of man. You know, there's different types of faith. There's mental faith. That's where you work it up in your head. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I really, really, really believe. I believe so much. Uh, that's where so many people come out with this false doctrine uh, and believe it, speak it, and it'll happen. Uh, if, folks, faith is not in your head. If your faith is in your head, it's just sticks, it's going to be blown away. Faith is not, I'll try harder. I'll try to believe it's going to happen. No, uh, that, that's where you hear somebody preach on, uh, I, just, I just know it's going to happen. And uh, they say, well, you know, they just didn't have enough faith. It's not based upon you. This type of I'll try faith is what you can do. It's where I think I can do something so strongly that it's going to happen. Like it depends upon you. Faith is never dependent upon you. Those are stick houses. Faith that will fall away. And we live in a day and time when people tend to give their life to Christ and then after they've lived for Christ a little while, they just get blown away. They just fall by the wayside. They, they stop serving. They quit serving. They find all sorts of other activities and say, well, we're going to get back into church. Now, I believe many of those people were just not saved to start with, but I believe some of them were. I believe some people that are saved are truly backslidden because they have just fallen away. They, they don't trust God anymore. Something happened that made them. God did not ever change. It's because their faith was not strong enough. They lose their faith. People have lost their faith and continue to lose their faith and it's because their faith is within themselves. What I can do, what I believe, how strongly I can believe or how much faith I have. And it's never been about me. Faith is in God. Faith is saying, my God can. And what I want might not come true. What I pray for might not happen. I have a grandson with cancer and I pray every day for God to heal him. I believe, I know my God can heal him. I know my God is able. I know that if it doesn't happen, that it's not because my God was insufficient in any way. I will not have an understanding, but I know this. 
My faith is in God, not in my prayers or not in what I'm able to do or what I can believe. I just have faith in God. We need to have faith in God and what He can do. Not in myself, but what God can do. Not what I can do, but what God can do. And if your faith is based upon you, you're building your house out of sticks. Your faith is going to be blown away. It will not stand up to Satan when he comes. Satan is just waiting for the chance to gobble us up. First Peter chapter 5, we read it. Seeking whom he may devour, destroy, eat up. And you're on the menu as far as he's concerned. And he's coming after you. And if you don't have your faith in God, in Christ Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, then your house of sticks is built upon what you can do. And you cannot stand. You cannot stand against the devil without God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5, concerning our faith, that says that it's in the power of God. Not in what I can do, but in what he can do. Then there's the house or the life that's built upon straw. You ever heard the phrase grasping at straws? You ever thought, well, what does that mean or where does that come from? You think, well, it don't mean much, you can't... You can't hand, hand on to it. Uh, have you ever been to a beach and picked up a handful of sand and tried to hold the sand? And the sand kind of comes out between your fingers and to keep it from falling, you tighten up. Well, you know what happens the more you tighten up? The more sand that runs out of your hand. You, you cannot hold it. You'll keep some of the sand in the palm of your hand, but most of that sand is eventually going to find its way out of your grass. If you've ever worked around hay, and you reach in and you pick up a handful of hay from over here to come over here and put it in the cow trough. If you pick up a bale to throw on a trailer and you take it and then you pick the bale up and you throw it out for the cows, you're going to notice all along the way, wherever you picked up, straw was falling. Pieces of straw are going everywhere. Straw is like that sand. If you grab a handful of straw and while you're holding on to it, pieces are going to continue to fall out. I want you today to realize that a house built out of straw is people trying to, to hold on to God. Trying to have a grasp on God without receiving Jesus Christ as their Savior. If you've ever seen a barn that's uh, built that's to store hay upstairs, uh, if it's built correctly, there's two doors up in the loft of the barn. One on this end that's open and one on the other end that's open. And if the wind blows on this end, straw is going to come out the other end. It's just going to drift away. And a lot of people who think they are religious, that they're okay, their life is just, dress, just drifting away and they can't catch it. They can't hold on to it. Many people's attempt at salvation is just grasping at straws. It's just an attempt at salvation. Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we, and I've inserted the word I there because I want us to personalize it, have I not prophesied in your name and, have, and in thy name have I not cast out devils? This person is saying, i got to be saved. I've done this. I've done that. I've, I've, I've carried this out. I've, I've fulfilled this obligation. And in thy name I've done many wonderful works. I think it's like somebody saying, I went to church. I went to church every Sunday. I went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Folks, coming to church will not save you. I was baptized. I've got a friend been baptized seven times. He jokingly says he knows all the tadpoles in the Mississippi River by name. Baptism will not save you. I've been good. I'm a good person. I've, I've never done anything bad. I've never cheated, robbed, or steal from anybody. All these things that we think, uh, I must be a good person. Or I believe. This one scares me more than any of the others because there's people that say, oh, I believe in God. Thus they think they're saved. I believe Jesus Christ came to this earth, died upon a cross, was buried, and rose again. And they think because they believe in a historical fact, in a biblical fact, that they're saved. Belief in itself is not enough. It's just like knowledge. You can know something, but it not change your life. Salvation is acknowledgement that you are a sinner, 
that Christ did die, but it's the commitment of your life to Jesus Christ as Lord. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 23, Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Do you remember when the verse started back a while ago in Matthew chapter 7, 22, and it said, Lord, Lord? They said, Lord, Lord, have I not? That's once again in that Greek language an, an understanding that the word Lord does not always mean the same thing in every situation. There in that verse, these people are saying Lord, Lord as an acknowledgement of who somebody is. The President of the United States, United States walks up and I say, Mr. President. That does not mean that I like him. does not mean that I agree with the politics of that certain president. But I acknowledge who he is. He's Lord. I might not like him, might not want to do what he orders as president, but he is still the president of the United States, and I acknowledge his position. There are people around the world that do no more to the presence of God. These Pharisees that are being spoken of here in Matthew chapter 7 were acknowledging, they were saying, Lord, Lord, but it was, it was a little Lord. It was, we know you say you are and that people believe you are, but I really don't. I'll acknowledge your name. But I do. And then there's the word for Lord that means you are my Lord. You are my Adonai. You are my master. You are the boss of my life. I do give you and commit my life to you, and my life does belong to you. That is that commitment of oneself to Jesus Christ no matter what. See, the straw house of works, or the straw house of religion, or the straw house of self events, activities, is not enough. Just a few weeks ago, I was talking to a pastor of a different faith. And as we were talking, he said, uh, I believe people are saved different ways. I believe if they belong to my church, they're saved. I believe they have to be baptized. And if they're baptized and belong to my church, they're saved. He said, I do not believe a person has to make Jesus Lord of their life to be saved. And he instantly said, and I know you don't agree with that preacher. I said, no. But you know, it don't matter what I think. He kind of gave me that. Because, you know, I guess he wanted to get in an argument with me about what I think and what he thinks. But I said, it don't matter what I think. God's the one that said, the sovereign God who saves you and me did not say you could be saved by being baptized. He did not say you could be saved by joining a church. And since he's the one that provided salvation, since he's the one that says, here's how to be saved, and since he's the one at the gates of heaven saying who comes and who don't, I think we ought to listen to what he says. And he says, by none other name than the name of Jesus. By, that means by no other way, but by Jesus can you get into heaven. Can you be saved? Can your sins be forgiven? The house of straw will be completely blown away when we enter into heaven and we stand before God in judgment. And if you do not know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, in His presence He will say, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. I never knew you. Go on to the place that's been prepared for you and the devil, I strongly ask you today, are you building your house a house out of straw? Your house will not stand. If you're a Christian and you're building your house out of sticks, your foundation's good, but your construction's wrong. Build your house out of the bricks of Jesus Christ upon the foundation Words of faith, God's word, serving him faithfully, lordship that I do and follow Christ no matter what. So when the devil comes knocking at your door, and when he says, I'm going to huff and I'm going to pluff and I'm going to blow your whole life away, you can respond in the name of Jesus Christ, you can't. Faith in him, standing on his foundation and knowing he has built the house any man that builds a house other than that in Christ Jesus it will not stand father in heaven